Carolina bays are shallow upland ponds. Uh, they're distributed from about North Florida through New Jersey. Uh, and they were formed during the late Pleistocene under climatic conditions uh, very different from present. Uh, um, from southwesterly, strong southwesterly winds that causes uh, you know, bay elongation uh, perpendicular to the wind direction and downdrift uh, shorelines and sand rims. And the sand rims, of course, then on, on the east side are the uh, preferred locations of most uh, uh, human settlement. And our interest in the bays uh, has led from our, you know, under the, the intensive use of these bays, especially by uh, the early hunter-gatherers and uh, but as the bays evolved during the late Pleistocene and early Holocene uh, the, uh, the, the ecological setting shifted and so we see uh, different uses of the bays throughout prehistory and so from a human standpoint that's what we're trying to, to examine but the other thing too is that uh, the evolution of the bays is directly linked to climate and so in the sediments of the bays not only do we have uh, archaeological materials but we also have uh, signals of climate change. And right here uh, in, in near Blackville, South Carolina, we're working at a bay and uh, that we've got some, you know, good, you know, early archaic uh, material from, you know, roughly eight to 10,000 years old. We found earlier material at bays, you know, elsewhere. And, uh, but anyhow, right now uh, we're looking at the, the sediments and the stratigraphy and uh, the geochronology through various dating techniques to understand you know, site formation processes and uh, the evolution of the bays. Uh, Dr. Ivester and I are basically working on this profile here and we're taking measurements with the magnetic susceptibility meter. And what that does, it gives us a, a measurement of the susceptibility of the sand grains to be magnetized. And we're hoping we can use that as a proxy for understanding how the, this sand ridge has built up through time. And hopefully it gives us some information about uh, cultural activity or, or uh, uh, such as fire or occupations through time that people living on the sand ridge or depositional environment. Um, you want to go into anything else on that? Yeah. Uh, well, this, this magnetic susceptibility of the sediments here respond to s several different factors, so uh, we don't, uh, it, it can uh, be affected by the, uh, the mineralogy of the diff different parts of the, the different layers or uh, the microbial activity that can produce a higher magnetic susceptibility. So we're, we're taking readings down column here and uh, we're going to look at relative variations in the susceptibility as you move down the uh, the sediment column to try to uh, use that, like like Chris said, to identify if there if there's any uh, uh, stratigraphy there that's not visible, but that we can pick up with a susceptibility. The way this works, though, is you can uh, you uh, just t uh, take this small meter here and just hold it right up to the profile, and you can get uh, you can get reading. So we're going uh, uh, right up the column here, measuring susceptibility all the way up and we'll look at how the susceptibility varies with depth and uh, use that to try to delineate different uh, horizons here. There may have been a, a stable surface at some time in the past uh, deeper down and so the susceptibility is one line of evidence along with a lot of the other things that we're looking uh, looking at in order to identify uh, buried surface horizons and uh, get a better understanding of how, uh, how this sediment uh, was deposited and that sort of thing. What I'm doing here is taking a continuous sediment column with this little uh, nice shovel tool here that we use and I'm going down from the surface down to the bottom of our profile and taking a continuous sediment column at every 2.5 centimeters. And we're going to use these samples for, uh, to run grain size analysis uh, and to also run a suite of uh, soil chemistry analyses including uh, uh, biogenic silica or plant phytolith, uh, various other uh, uh, analyses will probably will be performed on these samples, but the, the, the initial thing we're going to do is grain size analysis where we actually look at the uh, sand fraction uh, parameters to understand, again, as a proxy for depositional environment, uh, for uh, site burial, uh, site burial mechanisms, and for the, the formation of this sand ridge uh, over many, many millennia.
Some of the more uh, interesting and quite unique things that we found at some of our bays, uh, in this case Flamingo Bay, on the SRS are we found the presence of these uh, stone gastroliths or gizzard stones from probably waterfowl or perhaps even wild turkey or other uh, birds. We found these uh, numerous small, uh, up to a centimeter or a little bigger uh, in some cases, these polished stones that have the appearance of uh, almost the uh, similar to tooth enamel. And we noticed those last year working at Flamingo Bay in, in this previous season. We really paid a lot of attention to them and we found that they clustered probably in the early archaic levels of the site. Uh, and they were also definitely associated with uh, things like retouched flakes, utilized flakes, uh, other artifacts, uh, flakes or debitage, uh, charred hickory nut, uh, perhaps even some hematite, calcined bone, uh, calc calcined bone or burned bone. Uh, so all of these were found in association with these polished stones which indicate they, there was probably a lot of uh, uh, mass processing of waterfowl going on at at least some of these bays, in particular Flamingo Bay uh, during the early Holocene uh, 10, 12,000 years ago uh, when it was a much more open water environment. You may have had large migratory uh, waterfowl coming in at certain times of year. Uh, the presence of hickory nut possibly indicates a fall uh, uh, use of the site uh, in, the, in the fall of the year. So they may have been both processing hickory nut for food and for possibly smoking. Sm yeah, possibly uh, smoking meat. Because if you're mass processing the, the meat, uh, the, the only alternative, you know, real uh, preservation is either going to be drying or smoking. And uh, the use of hickory nuts for fuel doesn't make sense, but, but for smoking greasy meat, uh, like ducks tend to be greasy, right. uh, would fit in very nicely. So uh, we plan on doing some inorganic chemical analyses of the, of the sediments to uh, see if we can make that connection. Well, and of course, this is one thing that probably has been ignored by archaeologists for a very long time. And for the most part, pebbles or things that look like pebbles uh, are discarded in the field and they're not collected. And we, and we ran across these. It was sort of a serendipity in that we were collecting all, every pebble with uh, efforts to look at sort of geological processes and site formation issues. And in doing so, we noticed these polished gastroliths in numbers that were certainly uh, probably indicative of some kind of mass waterfowl processing. So this is a really important find and it really tells us something about hunt early hunter-gatherer life waves and how they may have, in addition to you know large animals, we think about hunter-gatherers hunting you know uh, certainly in the, the late the Pleistocene, you know the, the large megafauna uh, and, uh, and certainly deer were a major resource in the early Holocene. But these guys are also probably really focused on not only waterfowl resources, uh, but uh, turtles and anything else they can get in these bays. So it really drives home the point that these bays were a major resource draw uh, throughout the Holocene, but certainly during the early Holocene, maybe more so. Also, at Flamingo Bay this year, we were fortunate enough to excavate the, the uh, broken base of a Clovis point, uh, which is made out of an exotic raw material, uh, referred to in, by some people as a uh, welded vitric tuff. So we actually excavated this this year from Flamingo Bay, uh, which indicates we have the presence of a Paleo-Indian occupation, the earliest, you know, very obviously recognized cultural group in North America, 13,000, 13,500 13, years ago. Uh, so, and the fact that it's made out of a very exotic material, a very non-local stone, it certainly indicates the potential that this has traveled a great distance, perhaps even from North Carolina or other stone sources where they have other very fine grain, high quality metavolcanics. And so this is actually another thing that we're, we're, we're actually testing this rock uh, chemically to see if we can match it to some, uh, some of the sources in North Carolina that we've looked at that have very similar uh, types of rock. Which, and, and, and that uh, goes along and reinforces the idea that the, these very early hunter gathers, especially Paleo-Indian and early Archaic, uh, ha had extremely large uh, territories and uh, seasonal mobility patterns. And the implication is that a lot of this stuff was probably actually obtained directly from quarries everywhere from potentially North Carolina to uh, like the, the church quarries down here in nearby Allendale County. Mm -hmm.